welcome to Practically Prophetic. I just want to take a minute and just welcome you. This is really our first official uh, video podcast that we're going to try to have professionally done. And this is part of the new studio. We have a couple of sets going on. And there's also a place for interview style, just more of a lectern style for me to uh, preach or teach when I feel like it today I'm by myself and I'm just going to talk from my heart but uh, sometimes uh, the next few weeks there will definitely be interviews I'll be interviewing Dr. Alton McCollum again on uh, mental health and spirituality and the spirit feel prophetic um, gifts and emotions and personalities and also deal with the chemical imbalances and mental illness I, i've said for years and it gets me a lot of people think i'm crazy but bipolar is not prophetic and so <laughs> i think sometimes in the church we give people that have a mental illness almost a platform and thinking it's something spiritual when it's not and so we're going to be talking about that kind of stuff how to separate that how to discern that how to navigate through that using the bible has very clear parameters and how to help people get help as well get freedom uh, some people use the term deliverance which is not a biblical term but to find freedom and liberty um, and walk in wholeness and sozo which is completeness and salvation and healing uh, so we're doing a lot of that so welcome um, we're here we've done a lot of work my brother-in-law Jeremy had just stepped in as far as everything from uh, the cameras to the sound to the to the uh, sets and the design uh, there'll be a lot of changes still going on it's not perfect but just tell me what you think. I hope it's good. We're trying to work on the camera quality and the sound quality, but then my job is to work on the content part. And those of you that know me know that I've been in ministry now for 42 years, um, almost 43 in February. I'm married. Uh, you'll be hearing some from my wife. Matter of fact, she's launching her own podcast, The New Year. Um, going to be dealing specifically with women issues in the church. Um, I'm not going to tell you the name. I almost slipped, but I'm not going to do that. It's going to be fun. Uh, hers is definitely going to be fun. It's probably going to be a little cutting edge and controversial. Um, but I'm excited about that launching. We have other people joining. What we're developing is what we're calling Omni, which is Oasis Ministries Network International which means people that are in covenant with our network, people that are in covenant with us personally, ministries that we trust, and even incredible ministries in our local church. We've been so blessed uh, to have ministries in our local church that are growing, that have a voice outside of Oasis, that are mature, that we trust in areas from financing to Christian counseling, to marriage, to healing, um, to uh, practical life coaching, all sorts of things are represented. Um, and some just great Bible teachers that have great revelation. And we want to create a space, hopefully Omni and our channel and our social media channels, our end game is to have 24 seven content from people that we trust to where we can just be, Hey, I need to help on my family, help on marriage. Uh, what's, what's the Bible say about marriage and divorce or finances and debt? And how do I invest or where do I start with a budget? Just everything as simple as that to then my side on the practically prophetic is everything from prayer, the supernatural, uh, the gifts of the spirit, the fivefold ministry, angels, demons, the gifts of healing, the different types of healing in scripture, how to walk through the practical aspects of all that. That's more what I'll be dealing with. And that's why I call my little segment practically prophetic. Um, what I want to deal with today is simplest, simply is obstacles to faith. Uh, years ago, I preached a message at a lot of conferences and I, I just simply titled it, I'm on my way to a miracle. But in that was a little part that I had studied. And I don't know, because sometimes when you're preaching, and sometimes when you're doing more of a sermonic content, it's all about the result. I know when I preach, there's a difference between teaching and preaching. Teaching is information. Um, and sometimes I teach just like today. My main focus is to get the content, the teaching across. But preaching, I'm a lot of times focusing on results. So I may be 20 minutes in. I may be 10 minutes in. I may be an hour in ever how long and the Holy Spirit begins to move begins to reveal begins to show begins to shift and then I'm able to stop that and the Holy Spirit begins to does his work because I'm only preaching to create the atmosphere through the gospel preaching the good news to create such a climate of heaven on earth that people's spirit begin to respond they begin to get healed they begin to want to know more with Jesus repent of their sins get set free addictions behaviors whatever 
So that's a big deal. But I want to talk about these obstacles to faith or things that sometimes stop us as a believer. And I'll just walk through some scripture. It'll be more of a Bible study today. But Ephesians, I won't read all of Ephesians 6 because many of you that are watching this particular podcast are believers. This podcast is geared more to believers and people that are wanting to go deeper and even some that are in ministry. And in verse 13, um, Paul said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, a lot of people talk about spiritual warfare. I don't see the term spiritual warfare here. I see the term wrestling. But I also say, see, when you've done all, he's telling you what we're to do in the evil day. We are to stand. And having done all to stand, and then the first part of verse 14, which was stand therefore. So stand, having done all, stand, stand therefore. I think that's the greatest thing that we can do in this culture, in this season, in this time as believers, is to stand firm with the anchor of faith in the word of God. And in from this whole context today, I just want you to look at it from the way of standing, not maintaining, but standing and resisting. It's very interesting that scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The only way that a wall resists me if I run up against it is the wall is bigger and a much greater foundation connected to something greater. And the wall isn't moving, but yet it can resist me because it is an obstacle. If you are strong in the Lord and you have built up your most holy faith in the Holy Ghost, no matter what comes against you, if you're standing, whether it's sickness, accusation, poverty, um, spiritual attack, fear, whatever it is, it hits you. It's going to splat off of you. Thank you, Jesus, because you're standing. So let's talk a little bit about these obstacles. Um, number one, I, I want to go to First Peter 1. Faith will be tested. And so we talk about faith. We talk about faith comes by hearing. We talk about First John 5, 4. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. But the bottom line is your faith will be tested. Let me proof text it in First uh, Peter 1. Verse 6, where in greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. What? Wait, what? This was 2,000 years ago. Just imagine now, today, just take this personal rejoice that for a season, you're in manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. You're telling me that the fire and the trial of my faith that I'm going through right now is to purify my faith like gold so that it may be found with praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Wow go back to understanding more scripture of that is in James, James chapter one and verse two through six. I don't know if I read the whole thing. Let me go here. Um, um, yeah. Verse two, my brethren count it all joy. Again, you hear what Peter said. And then James is saying, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Wait a minute. Paul, Peter tells me rejoice. And then James is telling me, count it all joy. Now, Peter is the one that had the keys of the kingdom. Remember, he's the Acts 2 messenger. He was there on the day of Pentecost. He's the one that said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Okay, and then James, as the half-brother of Jesus, James gets converted. He comes along. He becomes the bishop or the head of the church as the big C church at that time. So you have both of these guys that are considered very legitimate and weighty telling you to rejoice, to count it all joy when you fall into temptation or when you're going through the trial of your faith. I think we forget that sometimes. I think we forget to step back in the trial, in the fire, in the torment, in the attack, and just start laughing in the face of the enemy and just begin to break out in praise. I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be. Is there something about it? Just get you excited when you think about, um, I can rejoice in this season. But even with all of that, and I'm going to walk through three or four different scenarios, your faith. And I just hope I proved to you biblically, I don't want to bore you uh, because some, so many people, I know you can read the Bible for yourself, but faith will be tested, but there are obstacles to your faith. So let's talk about number one, one of the greatest obstacles that people seem so surprised about 
to their destiny, to their faith, to their miracle, to the prophetic word over their life, to the prophetic fulfillment over their life. One of the greatest things that we seem to be surprised about is a lack of understanding from the church. We honestly get surprised when there's opposition within the church or within our Christian community, within our family, within our home, within our church. Um, two different uh, scenarios scripturally. One is in Matthew uh, 15, 23. It's the Canaanite woman. Remember the Canaanite woman comes because she is not a Jew. She is not in covenant, but she comes anyway. And she is begging Jesus to heal her daughter. So she is coming to Jesus. So this is a lady out of covenant coming to the very Messiah said, let all the little children come to me because he was talking about Jewish children. And there's something about covenant. There's something about membership has privileges. There's something about protocol. I understand all of that. Specifically, pre-Calvary, Jesus is operating as a rabbi while at the same time being the son of God, being the lamb that takes away the sins of the earth, being God manifest in the flesh. He is still a male Jewish rabbi in that first covenant scenario so she comes to him begging him and here's what he said but he answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she crieth after us and then the bottom line is in that scenario Jesus literally says, hey, it's not to me to take the children's bread and throw it to a dog. Okay, let's just stop right here. Jesus, who represents God, just called this woman a dog. Now, she should have and could have and you would have got offended. But she actually changed the term dog on him and said, well, even even puppies get the scraps or the morsels from the master's table. And the term she used and he used was kind of different. I heard somebody preach on this years ago. She kind of used the term lap dog. She said, go ahead and call me a dog. I'll just crawl up in your lap and take your scraps. And when he saw that kind of faith, he healed her daughter because of the faith. But I don't know so much if it was the faith or was it her lack of being offended? Because you look at the very first miracle that Jesus did. The very first miracle Jesus did is at the wedding in Canaan. Remember, Mary comes to him when they run out of wine and Mary is telling him, hey, they run out of wine. Maybe you can do something about it. Because at this point, she knew she had raised him and she was pushing him to be what the angel Gabriel had told her that he was. And she had already seen, there's so many stories uh, that she had already seen from the time he was 12 years old, this God particle, this God part of Jesus as Messiah. But then he looked at her and said, woman, what is it to thee? What is it to me? Which basically, what do you want me to do about it? Woman, what do you want me to do about it? It wasn't a term of respect. She could have been offended. It's amazing to me that the very first miracle of Jesus shows us the DNA that I'm talking to you now. How many of us have stopped our miracle, our ministry, or our destiny by getting offended, rejected, hurt, or bitter when it's simply God testing us, how desperate do we want it? How bad do we believe it? And how much are we willing to push through that I'm not going to allow my feelings to destroy my faith? How many of us have allowed our feeling, a lack of understanding from the church? So that's that's the premise of where Jesus starts. I do a, a whole message called the anatomy of a miracle where I walk through Jesus's first miracle, which you can walk through everything he ever did after that. It's the same steps and it's the same process. I wonder if a lot of us are hindered in our faith because of offense, because of fear, because of reject, because of the tone of somebody's voice, because of accessibility, because of something we heard somebody say about us, whatever that limits us. One more uh, proof text to this is in Mark 10, 13. They brought young children to him that he should touch them and his disciples rebuked those that brought them, rebuking them for bringing children. The Bible said his disciples rebuked them for bringing the children. But yet Jesus turned around and said, no, blessed are these. And he wanted the little children to come to him. What would have happened if the people would have listened to the disciples and not waited to hear what Jesus had to say? This is something I learned a long time ago dealing with pastors, with FIFO, with ministry, with whatever. I don't have to receive what you say about me or what the church thinks about me. I want to know what God says about me. I want to know what the final word that Jesus says about me. And 
a lot of times it means getting my spirit corrected to stay in that position, to stay in that same place. I don't leave it. I don't get mad. I don't shun it. I don't run away from it. What would have happened if Mary would have broke down crying and ran out of the wedding? What would have happened if the Canaanite woman had got offended? How dare you talk to me like that, you stupid Jew? I'm as good as you are. Or how about these parents? If they would have listened to what the disciples were saying, they were rebuking them. They just kept pressing on, bringing them to Jesus. Amen. So there's the misunderstanding of the church. What about scoffers? How many of us have been hindered in our destiny and our ministry by, by people just going, you're going to do what? You're called to do what? Who do you think you are? I'll never forget years ago when, when Stephanie and I first got married, my family had been missionaries. My dad was first generation minister. Uh, my mother's parents were not in ministry, even though, uh, they, her great grandmother was connected to so many ministries, birthed so many ministries as an intercessor, but they weren't technically vocational ministers. And I'll never forget, we were at a meeting and this quote unquote famous jerk came up to her and um, basically met me, hugged me, whatever, and then turned to her. She is standing by herself, beautiful, dear God, still is, but she was absolutely gorgeous at like 20 years of age. And he's like, he turned around and said, and who are you? And she said, well, I'm, I'm Stephanie. Uh, super. And he's like, no, I mean, who's your dad? And her dad was an incredible garage door installer from Houston, Texas. Don Denny, one of the best men I've ever known. Uh, not in ministry, very humble man, precious man. His, his father and his uh, stepfather were both in ministry, but life shifted and he had some health issues that happened. And, and there was all kind of a story of her family, but I never forget how it made her feel in that moment. What would have happened if that would have created such a seed of rejection in her that she had begun to try to become something that she may not be called to be simply because or, or not even pursue maybe what God had called her to be because of something somebody said. That wasn't the only time, but that was one of the main times that I can remember. Who are you? Who's your daddy? Who do you think you are? That kind of thing. In John 9, Jesus is passing by and saw a man that was blind from his birth. And the disciples literally ask him, hey, master, who sinned? This man or his parents? You know, who's somebody sinned here? And Jesus said, neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day, the night cometh that no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he sped on the ground and made clay of the spittle. Now, hold on, hold on. Okay. He gives a word. God's going to do this. They're not in sin. And then he reaches down and spits in the ground and begins to make clay out of the spit and the dirt and puts it on this guy's eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So go, I'm sending you. And he went his way, washed and came back seeing. What if he had been offended? <laughs> What if he literally had heard what they were saying? Hey, I think this guy's a sinner. And then Jesus says, no, he's not a sinner, but he reaches now and puts mud on his eyes. How many of us, the way God does it, the way he allows it, the people he uses, the circumstances he uses, how many of us would admit that sometimes it is so beneath us or sometimes it seems so demeaning or sometimes it stirs up our insecurities? Is it possible that we allow that to hinder us from the miracle power, not only the healing power of God, but the destiny. I'm talking to somebody today. Your ministry may involve looking like God is spitting the ground and is rubbing dirt in your eye. But if that's what it's going to take for you to see clearly, to walk into your destiny. But so many of us as humans, we have such a narcissistic view of who we are and what we deserve, specifically in Western culture right now, of what we are. We may need to remove ourselves from the throne of being our own God and submit to the ways because it doesn't make sense. His ways are so far beyond our ways. But what if misunderstanding of the church or what if scoffers or people treating us wrong or maybe even doing it in a way almost like a backhanded compliment um, offends us or causes us to, no, I'm not going to do this. This can't be God. This can't be miracle. This can't be right. How many of, of us have out, allowed that attitude to hinder us from the miracle? Uh, another one in John 18, um, 
I like this verse 18 through 25. The Jews did not believe concerning him that had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And it tells the whole story saying, is this your son who was born blind? How, do we, how does he does now see? And we, they said, this one thing we know, that this is our son. He was born blind. And they said, what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words speak his parents because they feared the Jews, because the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that Jesus was Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. That happened to Paul four or five times. And the parents kept saying, ask him. And when they called the man and said unto him, give God the praise, we know this man is a sinner. He said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. The blind man, Jesus spit and said, go wash. But here's the thing. The Jews did not believe. So after all of that opportunity to be offended, after all of that, hey, who's in sin? He could have got rejected. Why are they talking about me? Why are they talking to me about, am I a sinner? Is my parents a sinner? After all of that, he goes and washes. He comes back and can see. And now the church, the Pharisees, the judges, the religious right, so to speak, do not believe concerning him. But it didn't matter. He said, this one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Am I helping anybody today to understand these are roadblocks that could hinder the miracle? He refused to allow their unbelief, their scoffing, their rejection. They said, we don't believe. We don't believe concerning. He said, I don't care whether you believe or not. He did it for me. There's an old song that says, I was there when it happened. I guess I ought to know. So what about circumstances? We'll just go through these quickly because these are roadblocks to a miracle. This is obstacles to faith. What about circumstances? Luke 5, 18. Behold, men bring in a bed with a man that was taken with palsy. They sought means to bring him in and lay him before him. And when they could not find by that way, they might bring him in because of the multitude. They went up on the housetop and let him down through the roof <laughs> with his couch into the midst before Jesus. The roof had to come off. Some of you, I just feel this is a word for some of you. Some of you need to quit living under the circumstances. You need to climb on top of the circumstances and tell, tear a hole in the roof. Years ago, I pastored several little sisters in Louisiana, and I would ask them how they were doing. And they'd say, oh, I'm all right, Brother Suber, under these circumstances. And I preached the whole message at one time about climbing over circumstances because circumstances, you can accept your circumstances or you can climb on top of the roof and I'm going to tear down, tear through, tear up whatever I have to do to get in the presence of Jesus. I am going to get in his presence. I'm going to get in an environment of faith. I'm going to get into an environment of the supernatural and I'm going to pursue the presence and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the circumstances part. And then the last two parts is, number one, unbelieving friends. Unbelieving friends. So you have scoffers. You have the church or people that are religious, people close to you, sometimes even your family. You have circumstances. But then you have unbelieving friends. That's what Jarius in the story of his daughter um, in Mark 5. He goes to Jesus, but then they come and meet him and say, thy daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the master any further? Why do you trouble him any further? Because your daughter is dead. There are people surrounding you right now that really will discourage you from getting the, for pursuing the presence of Jesus. Who is it in your life? Could be your spouse, could be your parents, could be your children, could be your neighbor, could be your friend that are discouraging from pursuing because the circumstances has already happened. She's already dead. There's no even any reason for him to come. <laughs> but yet he went anyway. And I love that concept. Why troublest thou the master any further? And we all know that Jesus went anyway. He fell down and worshiped Jesus at his feet. And he went and he put them all out of the room. And he said, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. He called her name. She'd come back alive. But I just want to ask you, are you surrounded with people that are trying to talk you out of pursuing a resurrecting anointing? They're trying to talk you out of pursuing the word of the Lord, the thing in your heart that you want to have faith for, whether it's your business, your ministry, your career, your marriage, 
your money, whatever it is, your, your children, your unsaved children, whatever it is that you're trying to have a burden and have faith for. I'm asking you today, hear the voice of the Lord because he may be wanting to go to your house and do a miracle. And then the last thing, I'm going a little longer than I wanted to today, but I just want to leave this with you. And I want to pray with you. And I just want, hope this is helping somebody to remove the roadblocks, to remove the obstacles, to go back. Okay, things aren't happening like I thought they would. I'm not seeing the release of the miracle, the healing, the, the expectation, the career, the ministry, whatever it is that God's spoken over to you. I'm not seeing this release like I thought I would. Why? Check these roadblocks. Check these obstacles. Because the last one's extremely important in John 11. It's the story of, of um, Lazarus and the Mary and Martha. And it's the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. And I'm going to call it divine delays. Be very careful. Because the disciples, the sisters sent unto Jesus and said, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified thereby. And we're like, ooh, we're going to get excited about that. But then he delays for four days. He delayed going. He says, this sickness is not unto death. And then after four days, they get word that Lazarus is dead. And this is what he tells his disciples. After telling them this right now, this sickness is not unto death. Then he says, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes. Because he knew he was the end from the beginning. He knew what was going to happen. He said he's dead. So here's what I want to ask you. What? Because he was the resurrection and the life, which means he knew Lazarus was not going to die. He knew that even though there was a three-day, four-day, five-day, ten-day space, it didn't matter. He was the resurrection and the life. That's what he told Martha later on. But yet here he is. The disciples are bound in time. They are bound in logic and time and looking at everything horizontally and so they can't see it and he says i'm glad for your sakes and then he goes to the tomb of lazarus says roll away the stone they said hey he stinks i preached a message years ago sometimes it takes a stink to bring god they rode the stone back he spoke lazarus come forth and he arose but what i want to ask you today after all these things are happening sometimes a hindrance or something that can create us a lack of faith is a divine delay where God is trying to operate on his time and we don't understand it and we get offended. And in this story, we're like Mary that did come running to worship. Now she's sitting, sucking her thumb, upset and offended because Jesus didn't come when she thought he ought to when her brother was alive. But it was a greater miracle for the resurrection to call him in the tomb and for him to come forth. Don't be offended and don't be sidetracked. And don't be distracted by a divine delay. People say, how do I not? What do I do in a divine delay? Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus all the way back to the city, to Bethany. Follow Jesus all the way to the graveyard. Follow Jesus to the tomb. And let Jesus tell you when to roll back the stone. Because if they had refused to do that, if Mary and Martha had refused to go, and if the disciples had said, you're crazy, he's dead, we're not even going, there wouldn't have been a miracle. So I'm going to ask you what has been delayed that you may need to pray into. How do I follow Jesus even in my disappointment, even in my delay, even in my discouragement? How do I follow him to see the miracle happen? Amen. Hope this helps somebody today. Give us some feedback. This was more of a Bible study. I think our next couple of ones are going to be interviews. There's so many things we're going to be talking about. But we're going to be creating a lot of content. What I'm doing right now is just going through a lot of my 40 years of notes of things that I may never preach again in a conference or a church setting because there's so many new things I'm dealing with. And I just want to take these eternal truths and try to help somebody. So Father, I pray right now, I pray that you would allow the man and woman that's watching even now, that you would allow every obstacle, every roadblock to be removed, give them wisdom, revelation, understanding, to be able to pursue not only the word of the Lord, the will of the Lord, but the manifestation, the tangible evidence of the fruit of the miracle, the relationship, the ministry, the calling, the word that you have spoken over their life. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, love you guys. Hope to see you soon. God bless.